Welcome to the Clemens Library Book Quorum. We're so happy to have you all here with us. Uh, as I was mentioning a couple minutes ago, go ahead and take that opening poll if you'd like uh, about your leadership style. We're going to be talking about leadership today. And um, just a reminder that we do record the Clemens Book Quorum and that you'll receive a copy of the recording later today. Um, <clears throat> there we go. Just a quick tutorial. You're finding the chat just fine. Please remember to select all panelists and attendees. You'll notice that the conversation goes by very quickly. So because of that, we'd love for you to remember to put your questions in the Q&A section. So in there, you can ask questions. If you click on the little thumbs up sign, that's an uh, indication that you also would like to hear the answer to that question and it, it will move it up in the queue. And if you have comments or answers to questions, if you hit comment, it will stay along with that question. And we can also uh, post answers with the question or choose to answer them after the presentations today. So please use the Q&A section. Also, I'll note last week, um, and we were talking about this before the program started, we're all still figuring out Zoom, but if you uh, select, if you go in and select the side-by-side um, -side version, then you can also uh, see the person beside the, um, presentation beside the slides and you have the option of looking at one person or the gallery view. So uh, play around with your settings a little bit and see how you like it best. I can only control so many things about what it is that you see. So uh, take, take a chance to see how you like it. All right, today's program, the Clemens Book Lamp, <clears throat> is brought to you by the William L. Clemens Library, located on the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The Clemens Library enables the discovery, learning, and teaching of American history through the collection, conservation, digitization, and availability of primary sources on paper. And so you see our beautiful Avenir Foundation uh, reading room in this photo filled with researchers. We hope that at some point we'll get back to that. To that. One of the things that we talked about when the stay at home orders started was how to connect with the community and keep that learning and discovery going. And as we were brainstorming some of our favorite ways to interact with each other and with um, our fellows and supporters, we, we talked about Clemens Library Tea Time. The researchers are invited to join the staff and um, curators for tea at 10 a.m. every morning. And it's a great way to talk about research, to discover new things, new resources that people didn't know were at the Clements Library and to get to know each other, talk about books. And that inspired us to um, create this Clement, Clements Bookworm program where we can really do some of that um, e exploration together. So thank you so much for joining us for this program. Today's topic is on leadership. We'll be talking uh, leading by example, and I'm looking forward to introducing each of our panelists today. But first, let's take a look at that opening poll. Um, we, I'll just hit end polling and share results. Uh, it looks like our participants lead through the democratic process the most and coaching comes in second. There are a lot of ways to describe leadership styles. So um, I know some people put unknown and I realize that might be also be other. So it'll be fun today to see how we relate to the different styles that we're going to talk about from these books. All right. 
Our first presenter today is Doug Johnson. Doug is a longtime Clements Library associate and an avid lecture attendee who makes the trip from East Lansing for our programs. Doug's childhood interest in trains led to a volunteer um, cataloging and research, research uh, um, position for um, helping with a history of the Michigan Electric Railway. Sorry, Doug, I didn't mean to stumble over that, but it's such an interesting story and so, so cool that you got involved with that. Um, Doug's 31 years working for over nine agencies for the state of Michigan uh, have provided him with many perspectives on leadership. So welcome, Doug. Thank you, Angela. And good morning, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to bring this book to your attention. The Bookworm is a great resource. Joining so many wonderful panelists discussing worthwhile ideas has been a highlight of the last few months. I was just checking to make sure my microphone wasn't on mute. Nope, you're good. We can hear you. Okay. This book rewards our attention in two ways. First, any work by Doris Kearns Goodwin is a good bet. Second, we all yearn for leadership. Kern's first book, I call her Kern's because that's the way I got acquainted with her when she was Doris Kern's. Her first book, Lyndon Johnson and the American Dream, was published in 1976, three years after Johnson's death. In a 2015 interview with Charlie Rose, she said that her experience with Johnson taught her to look empathetically and non-judgmentally at the people she studied in order to understand them from the inside out because that's what Johnson taught her to do with him. Over the next 40 years, and I'm giving these names in the order of the books she published, she looked at the Kennedys, the Fitzgeralds, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, and Taft. In today's book, Kearns considers four great leaders, Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, and Lyndon Johnson. The power of her work is crafting engrossing stories about how these four reacted to and sought to affect the disparate situations confronting them. Her past studies of each figure give authority to her work. The book is organized into three cycles of four chapters. Part one, relates the entry of each into the public domain. The second recount dramatic reversals in their private and public lives. And in part three, she selects a challenge faced by each and analyzes how those situations interacted with their strengths and characters. In introducing part one, she writes, in their 20s, setting forth to forge their public identities, they appear very different from their sober, iconic countenances that have since saturated our culture, currency, and memorial sculpture. Their paths were anything but certain. Their stories abound in confusion, hope, failure, and fear. We follow mistakes made along the way from inexperience, cockiness, lack of caution, outright misjudgments, and selfishness, and see the efforts made to acknowledge, conceal, or overcome these mistakes. Their struggles are not so different from our own. In part two, we find Lincoln, as an Illinois legislator, had promoted an ambitious public works program that floundered as the state experienced a severe recession. Feeling his reputation had been compromised after his many expansive promises about that program, he fell into such a deep depression that friends sanitized his room of any weapons of self-destruction. In his own words later, he said, his recovery came from a passion to link his name with something that would redound to the interest of fellow man. He resumed the practice of law 
this time with zeal and a focus on both the technical matters of the law and on the art of communication. Theodore Roosevelt lost both his mother and his wife within about 11 months of each other when he was, or was maybe 11 hours of each other when he was 22 years old. Later, after a series of failed crusades while a New York state legislator and other public defeats, he escaped to the Western frontier where in those few years, he organized cattle ranchers and promoted the conservation of big game, which gave him skills in organization and working with people. An athletic Franklin Roosevelt was at the age of 39, devastated by what was thought to be polio at the time. Guillain-Barre syndrome may be a better explanation for the severe crippling. With irrepressible optimism and grit, he pursued recovering physical and mental strength. And when he re-entered public life, the intensity of his determination to appear strong became a key component of his success. Elections for Lyndon Johnson were seen by him as referenda on his personal worth. His loss in a 1941 run for the U.S. Senate despite openly purchasing entire Texas precincts, led to a darkening of temperament, mistrust, and anger that became immense obstacles in his efforts to better the lives of others. Moving to the third section, the book becomes almost like a case study from Harvard where our author has a long affiliation. The chapters develop the nature of the problem she has selected for them, interspersed with what are what I'll call maxims, which distill different aspects or aspect, aspects of the problem into advice. As with the best Harvard case studies, these chapters are quite specific. She lists 17 such maxims for Lincoln, 19 for Theodore Roosevelt, 16 for Franklin Roosevelt, and 18 for Lyndon Johnson. When viewed together, it's clear that the maxims abstracted from one leader's approach are in direct opposition to those from others. These illustrate the flexibility required in a leader to find the best response to problems of the moment. The case studies comprise nearly half the book. And I'll close by teasing you with the, select, with the challenges selected by Goodwin. Starting with Lincoln, he used transformational leadership to ready his cabinet and the country for the Emancipation Proclamation. He had already, after deep personal reflection, determined that a major shift in direction of the country was necessary, especially after McClellan's army suffered a crushing defeat at Richmond and Lincoln's other efforts to reach compromise had failed. Theodore Roosevelt applied crisis management to solve the great coal strike of 1902. The mine owners' refusal to recognize labor organizations and the increasing desperation of workers suggested impending violence from both sides. Franklin Roosevelt applied turnaround leadership to address the Great Depression. His approach formed a foundation still in place in today's corporate merger and acquisition industry. Lyndon Johnson brought visionary leadership. JFK's assassination created a need to calm the country, and he saw and seized opportunity. His dream was to use the government to improve the lives of people. This was to be done by blending the popular reverence for JFK's stalled legislative agenda with Johnson's leadership, breaking the log jam in Congress to pass laws providing a tax cut, civil rights, voting rights, 
student financial assistance, and medical insurance for the poor. In closing, it's tough to cover in the time we have this morning, the rich detail of Goodwin stories. But I'll just refer to uh, the fireside chat example from FDR as an example of the rich detail that we find in the book. After inauguration on the 4th of March, Roosevelt set, set forth to address the problems created by the depression. And just over a week later, he delivered the first of several fireside chats. Well, far from being the informal, casual, uh, off the cuff uh, approach that was suggested, uh, he worked for days testing out his message with his cabinet and working with a suggested speech from the Department of Treasury. So when he sat down in a small room with a bank of microphones and a, only a few other people, he started out, I want to tell you what has been done in the last few days, why it was done and what's going to happen in the ahead. And with that, he was off. And the, the phrase fireside chat has become a part of the lexicon and is a model that's still followed today. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Wow, that I, I'm super excited to add this book to my list because it's, um, you know, I, the, the idea of how flexible these leaders had to be and as you mentioned how each of them did things that wouldn't have worked in the other situations it's really interesting to to really think about that um i just want to remind everybody that if you have a question go ahead and put it in the q and a section and we will answer questions at the end um, of all of the discussions and presentations. So we're ready to introduce Sarah Kwashny. Um, Sarah's reached the forum. Thank you for coming back. And she is an information resources assistant at the Clements in both Reader Services and with the Manuscripts Division. Um, she was one of the editors of the 2019 Clements publication, Americana is a Creed, and is an avid reader. So we, we love, love to have her on the, this program. Thanks for joining us. And I understand you'll be sharing uh, the perspective of collective leadership today. Yes. Um, so let me make sure my volume is turned up here. Um, I have been reading Code Girls recently by Liza Mundy. Um, and when we were kind of talking about leadership for this week's segment, um, kind of thought maybe this would be a neat um, book to talk about sort of a different type of leadership and a different approach to leadership um, than maybe we sometimes think about. Um, so Code Girls follows the story of code breaking operations in the United States during World War II, um, the bulk of which was performed by women. Um, I was actually really excited. One of my friends gave me this book for my birthday or something some years ago. Um, because in library school, um, I did a research project on Bletchley Park, the British Code Breaking Operations Center that worked on the German Enigma Code, um, specifically for the German Navy, um, how they were communicating with their U-boats. Um, and it had touched a little bit about American code breaking operations, um, but obviously not incredibly in depth. Um, so it was an interesting comparison. Uh, so now I finally know a little bit more about that. Um, so Code Girls discusses, um, it, she does a good mix of blending both um, a little bit of the early history of cryptanalysis in the United States, um, which is what I'm gonna kind of talk about first, and then moving into also the social history of um, kind of the women who were working in these different um, units. So there were three main code breaking operations in the United States during World War II that she sort of segments them into. Um, the two big ones are obviously the codes related to the European theater, um, specifically the German Enigma code, um, as well as some of the other German codes in use. And then for the United States in particular, 
um, Japanese codes in the Pacific Theater. So they also worked on other codes, um, commercial codes, uh, codes of other governments, um, anything that was coded that they could intercept, they were trying to read pretty much for the most part. Um, so code breaking in the United States um, was still a pretty small operation um, at the outset of World War II. Um, the United States was intercepting codes, um, particularly Japanese diplomatic codes, even before the entrance of the United States into the war. Um, they kind of wanted to keep tabs on things, especially as um, after World War II had started, but before the United States had entered. Um, so here on the screen is an example of an intercept um, that the universe, uh, sorry, the United States intercepted prior. Um, this is back in 1939. Um, and it kind of gives a good example of sort of the types of code readouts that um, cryptographers were intercepting. So um, there's codes. She does a good job of breaking down all the different technical aspects um, of the different codes. Um, but the big thing she points out at the beginning, which was good, was um, the difference between codes and ciphers and how these were used. So a code um, takes a word or phrase and it you change it into either um, a series of numbers, a series of letters, or maybe another word. Um, and so shorthand is one of the most commonly known and used forms of code. Um, a cipher, you're taking a word and you're directly taking each individual letter and converting it into another letter or number. So a lot of the codes that they were receiving might be encoded and enciphered. Um, and code breakers would then have to figure out, well, how to decipher and decode. Um, and to add an extra layer of security at times, um, the Japanese government or military would use additives, which is where if you have a word or phrase that had been encoded and enciphered, you would then, if it was a number, you'd have this other number that you'd add onto it to further insert. So you'd have to figure out the additive and then to, yeah. <laughs> so um, it was really interesting learning about the whole process. Um, if you like or are interested in this type of thing, you can actually kind of do it for fun still. Um, I ran across this the other day at the Cryptogram book. Um, this is just pretty much ciphers. Um, so, or you may have run into these before in like activity booklets or something. Um, but this one, it's a little hard to see, but you can have um, like each individual letter, these are random letters, and you have to figure out what the actual letter is that it's enciphering. Um, so, it was really interesting learning about the different tricks that they use. Um, if you watch Wheel of Fortune, knowing uh, the most commonly used letters in the English alphabet, um, consonants, vowels, so R, S, T, E, L, N, E, O, A, I, <laughs> um, as well as uh, certain pairings of letters. So T, I, O, N is often paired together, I, N, G, things like that. Um, so it was really fun to follow it along, kind of from a, a puzzle aspect. Um, but you kind of have to take your time in those sections of the book too to really understand. Okay, they're talking about the um, water transport code. What types of things um, is this enciphering and how are they using it and how do they break it down? And um, So as the code breaking operation grew, they were able to kind of make more of an assembly line approach where uh, the women recruited would only be doing one specific task. Um, you'd have someone doing the translation. You'd have someone figuring out just like the address of where the uh, intercept was coming from um, to figure out if it was maybe important or not. And then you had other women working on figuring out the additives for the code, things like that. Um, it was sometimes a slow business, particularly at the outset of the war. Um, code breaking wasn't really viewed as a very prestigious thing, um, particularly in the Navy because it was shore duty and if you wanted to build a career in the Navy, more time spent out at sea was better um, in terms of promotions. Um, so that's also kind of what led to them recruiting women, along with the fact that a lot of the men were going off to war. Um, they thought, well, women are very good at being meticulous and organized. Um, teachers, librarians, they'll be really good at this. And a lot of women who were going to college, which was a very small percentage of American women by the beginning of the 1940s, um, did end up going into teaching because that was one of the only professions that a college-educated woman could get. Um, but Obviously, this changed completely during World War II. Um, so here we have the site of Army code breaking operations um, in just across the river from Washington, D.C., Arlington Hall, a former women's junior college finishing school. Um, they needed a site close to Washington uh, where they could maintain operations and also 
um, establish housing for all the women they were recruiting. So in 1941, um, the Navy and the Army, separate operations, very competitive for quite a while, um, until really after the war when they finally merged everything, um, were starting to recruit women. Uh, the Navy specifically looked at uh, members, uh, students at the Seven Sisters Colleges, as well as Goucher College out east, um, because these were prestigious women's colleges, often the women's college affiliate of prestigious schools such as Harvard, Brown. Um, they also wanted women of a certain class. They needed, you know, they thought they needed a good background. These were women who would have upright moral uh, standing. Um, and so they recruited these women uh, through professors at the colleges. And then they started in a correspondence course, learning the basics of cryptography um, and continuing on until their time when they arrived at either Arlington Hall or um, the Navy headquarters in DC proper. Um, they also, after they arrived, um, further expanded their horizons by learning aspects of um, shipping, military uh, jargon, uh, as well as geography. A lot of these women, uh, hadn't really been, some of them have been outside of the US, but you know, they didn't necessarily know all the specifics of the Pacific. Um, and so they learned more about that. The army on the other hand was recruiting uh, more from teachers colleges. Um, they were also starting to look in the Midwest more because they tried to recruit from where the Navy was recruiting and the Navy got mad because they were taking their women. Um, so they had to expand elsewhere. Um, and then later on, you see kind of differences in terms of the workforce as well. The Navy went on to establish the WAVES program, um, which recruited a lot of women into code breaking um, after certain breakthroughs midway through the war, I'll touch on a little bit, um, as well as the civilian women who had been working for the Navy, a lot of them joined WAVES and were commissioned as officers. Um, and so it became more of a um, military regimented system. Um, Arlington Hall, it seems, was a little more eclectic. Um, Liza Mundy talks about it sort of as a flat organization. You had the mix, you did a Navy, the Navy as well, but um, you had enlisted men, you had officers, you had uh, civilian men, uh, a lot of times academics who maybe weren't deemed fit for military service or were too old to be drafted, as well as civilian women and um, some wax, uh, the army program for women as well. Um, but it was a little more uh, chaotic, as they call it, a productive chaos. Um, so you might have a 23 year old woman in charge of a unit because they recognized that she was really good at what she did and so she was put in charge, um, but at the same time you might have military officers as well, um, except of course for the upper leadership that was still under the purview of the military. Um, so it's, it's really interesting looking at the point of um, code breaking was this collective effort. Um, you had certain people um, I think the most famous example is over in Bletchley Park in Great Britain, Alan Turing helped develop the bomb machine which would run through um, the possible uh, key settings for the Enigma cipher. Um, something that you know would take ages longer if just humans were doing it. Um, but a lot of the breakthroughs were done in sort of this collective fashion. You had a department working on a specific thing and you had all of these very intelligent people working on it together and they would sort of feed off of each other's ideas and someone might have run across something in their work that they happen to remember this particular number combination comes up a lot. It must be um, something important. Maybe we can use it as a crib, which was a word that would be commonly used or a phrase that you could then try to decode from. Um, so in terms of Navy intercepts, weather reports um, were very common things sent and um, you get a lot of common words like rain, wind, um, or a lot of times they would start their messages the same way, dear so-and-so, or I'm recording, and so they would be able to use these methods. Um, and so in that way, it, it forms the foundation for what we now know as the National Security Agency, the code break breaking operations in the United States, um, and the fact that uh, kind of women were involved from the beginning, um, and their type of work in that helps uh, influence how the agency becomes structured during the war and after, even though a lot of the women did leave. Um, the other thing that she talks about, besides all the technical aspects, co-breaking operations, um, is the social lives um, and experiences of the women working. Um, so here is an example of a room at Arlington Hall um, featuring some of the women code breakers. Um, Anne Carr Christie, 
um, who's on the far right in this picture is a name to kind of keep in mind. I'm not gonna spoil it for the book, um, but she is a very smart, fresh out of college um, kind of recruit into the system. I think she starts around 1942, 1943, um, and uh, she is instrumental in certain very important aspects of code breaking in the war and after. Um, but a lot of these women, uh, you know, some of them were from very small towns, some of them lived very sheltered lives beforehand, sort of expanding their horizons. You can see this really exciting place to live during the war. You have a ton of people coming and going. There's all sorts of cultural activities. They're learning about places and things that they never knew about before, and they're tasked with very important things. Um, secrecy was paramount, um, and so often these women wouldn't even discuss their work with their roommates who might be working on the same project, but maybe in a different department. Um, and they were either living in a dorm setting, uh, they had some hastily constructed uh, Arlington farms, um, as well as uh, later kind of once getting their bearings in the city, or if you know they had an idea beforehand, living in boarding houses and um, behind storage and just, you know, like packed like five people to a single room apartment. And if you had a midnight shift, you might sleep in the same bed as the girl who then worked during the day and you'd swap off. Um, and so it was kind of an exciting time. You know, they're keeping house for the first time. They're learning how to, if they have a car, how to manage that <laughs> in wartime. Um, but it was really neat. Um, I think it's interesting too. She touches a little bit at the end talking about how some of the roles that women played um, going forward did change perspective on women in certain work. The WAVES program, when it first started in the Navy, a lot of people thought, well, only bad women go into the Navy. You know, they're these camp followers. Um, they're just trying to seduce the men in the Navy. Um, but after the women would go through boot camp, they got very nice stylish uniforms um, because the Navy wanted to make sure that, you know, in the news photographs that this program came out looking good. Um, and they started their work and they came home. A lot of their families were really proud to say that they had daughters who were also contributing to the war effort. Um, but a lot of women did leave after the war. It was kind of considered the patriotic thing to do, to seed your job, go home, start a family. Um, some women did stay in code-breaking efforts after the war, but a lot of times um, only until they had children or if they stayed longer, it was because they never married, but they did form a uh, close friendship with a lot of the women code-breakers. So a lot to unpack there, but it's really interesting um, reading about kind of, you know, this big critical moment in terms of going forward, you know, how cryptanalysis in the United States looks like and the developments that went into that as well. Yes, and I, I, I think it's a, a great um, way to point out that that leaders don't have to be in, in the highest administrative roles, that that leadership is is something that can can be done at any level and especially in a system like this where um, uh, where where you know the equality wasn't wasn't there yet that you know women women had to show leadership in in a different way and in a collective way uh, so that's really great I know that um, that you had mentioned uh, a collection at uh, the Clemens? Yes. Um, so I, I was digging around uh, the other day thinking, like, do, do we have this thing? This would be really interesting. Um, I haven't gotten a chance to dig too far into the World War II collections yet. Um, but I did find one, um, the Elizabeth Bonnie Vandenbosch collection. Um, it's a small collection, um, but it does have paperwork. Um, particularly like administrative paperwork and photographs related to her service. Um, but she served in the waves. Um, she went to officer school up at Smith College in Mount Holyoke, which the book talks about. Um, and a lot of times to the chagrin of uh, the men still back working at uh, code breaking operations in Washington when they were taking the women who had formerly been civilian who were then drafted in, or enlisted in the waves program as officers. They were losing them for several weeks at a time to go up to officer training. They're like, can you, can you hurry up? We need them back here. Um, <laughs> but um, she served up there. And then it's, uh, I'm finding a note, she did uh, serve in a coded communications unit in Washington. So I'd be interested to see um, what further information is contained in that material. Um, it sounds like she had a pretty interesting life story too. Um, she married and military officer. They lived in Hague for a while following the war, and then they ended up um, living in Ann Arbor, raising their family there. Um, 
But the one thing you might notice that our collection doesn't have, um, which is probably near impossible to come by, is um, the women would send a lot of letters to men, their family back home, uh, but secrecy was enforced and a lot of these women couldn't talk about their experiences even until like seven years after the fact because after the war a lot of code breaking was still maintained slash converted into Soviet code breaking. And so um, you noticed in the book too, a lot of her um, information, uh, firsthand accounts are taken either from like very dry matter of fact informational memos um, that have since been declassified fairly recently. Or a lot of them are oral histories or memoirs of people involved um, probably within the last 10 to 20 years. Um, she, in fact, uh, interviews uh, several code breakers, um, including one shortly before her death. Um, so that's, if you're looking for a diary or a letter that has all that really interesting in-depth material, you're not gonna find it. And a lot of um, the paperwork um, manufactured during these operations was either burned uh, at the time, um, once they had certain things, you know, in order to make sure it wasn't stolen or compromised, um, they did have pretty large incinerators on site or um, it was classified for a long time and some of it may still be. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, this is very interesting. And again, how am I ever going to read all of the books <laughs> you all bring to my attention? I just, there isn't enough time, but this is very cool and another one to add to my list. So thank you so much. Uh, just a reminder, everybody, put your questions in the Q&A section and at the end we'll answer those. In the meantime, I would like to introduce our final panelist today. Uh, Strauss Scantlin is currently working on his graduate degree in history from Pittsburgh State University and is stationed in Hawaii where it's 4 a.m. So he wins, wins the prize for um, most committed to the bookworm. And Strauss comes from a long line of military personnel that go as far back as the Continental Army. Um, Strauss, please tell us more about what you're sharing today. Uh, thank you very much, Angela. So just a, a note for Sarah, my great aunt was a first lieutenant in Europe as a public affairs officer uh, for World War II. So it, it comes on uh, both both sides of the of the biology, males and females in my family. So I'm here to talk about thinking in time. So a little bit different aspect of leadership, preparing your leader for their decision they have to make. And I was recently introduced to this book by the Indo-Pacific Command historian. We have a historian on, on staff uh, that works in a uh, top secret room, keeping all the history and a lot of it is classified like Sarah was talking about. But this was a really interesting book and it actually pushed me, the, the final thing to push me into, into pursuing a degree in history. So it's really interesting. Uh, Neustadt and May, the authors, they applied a lot of what they'd done over the years in teaching this class of how to, how to influence leaders and how to work on their decision making. And they wrote this book just to kind of write it all down. And what I found interesting was that they, the first thing they said is not to jump to conclusions or a solution, to go ahead and, and just sit back and think a little bit. And, you know, you don't want to uh, take your problem to your boss. You want to focus on their problem because every, every level of an organization has their own problems. But uh, as, a, as a leader at your level, your job is to make sure only your boss's problems are, are taken to them. Both, both of the authors understood that time was critical and you have to be selective and specific in what you want to talk about. And so to help that, that's one of their, two of their three rules of thumb. And then the, sec, the third one is the journalist questions. And you're going to go through these a couple of times, but the first time is to focus on the when and the where, to really frame your problem, frame the situation and what you know about it, the who, the what, the where, the when, the how, the why. You answer all of those, then you go back after you focused on the when and where's to really focus on the how's and why's. And that really gets you into the, into the meat of the problem or meat of the, of the situation. Finally, just a, a simple comparison with the pros and cons to help clarify uh, what, 
what uh, avenue you're going to take on the decision. And then, you know, we're all biased in some way. We all have, have our own influences. You want to test your presumptions with some prompting questions. And they presented a really interesting way to look at that. And one is odds, betting. You know, how, how likely do you think this will happen is a really hard question to answer. Is it 52%? Is it 54%? It's better to say, would you bet $100 that this would happen? Would you bet $1,000? And the more money you're willing to bet, probably more likely you think that event will happen. And then they finished off, uh, oh, I apologize. They, uh, then they also asked a question that the chief of staff of the army uh, asked once in a, in a presentation is, how, what would change your mind? What piece of information would make you change your mind on this decision? And the chief of staff of the army actually asked it in a little different way and said, uh, what, uh, when was the last time you had let a subordinate change your mind? So that's pretty interesting. Then the, the final, final big step is the, to use intervals and to think in time streams, you know, weeks, days, months, taking the past and looking at it as a, as it flows into your current situation and then goes out towards, you know, the future and what you think may or may not happen. Next slide, please. So here are the steps. Um, and they're, uh, they're pretty cut and dry and, but they flow in and out of each other. And, and we've already covered a lot of these. Uh, but again, I think the most important, are looking back in the history of the issue. How did we get here? What happened? And also, how do we how do we think what we decide will change change the future? The pros and the cons. What can we do now? And then also the uh, challenging your own presumptions, making sure that what you think happened and will happen is really what what happened and what will happen. And then the final step analyze the relevant stereotypes about the people and organizations involved. And I think this is one of the key things. They didn't say stereotypes were bad. Everyone uses them. It's a, a heuristic we use for decision-making to quickly go through and, and just like the, uh, the ciphers and the, the keywords that you kind of recognize as you go on, it helps. But just realize you are using stereotypes and they may be wrong and making sure that your stereotype is used the right way, I think was really a really good part of that book. And what I really got out of this book was how to, and not in a bad way, but how to influence leadership in their decision-making and how to really present a, a, a clear, concise recommendation to your boss. And it, this is an aspect of uh, leading from below that we don't talk about a lot because leaders happen at all levels, I think, as, as Angela said. And uh, so this was a really, really good book on, on how to frame your thinking to really help a, a leader decide something. Thanks, Thank Strauss. Um, I was just wondering, I know in um, the book, Doug was talking about there are case studies. Are, are, are there any case studies in this book? Uh, there are some case studies and I unfortunately don't have any with me. My, as I said, I borrowed this book and I had to return it. Um, That's my, fine. I just thought it might be something people would want to know. No, th yes, there are. They, they are really heavy on the case study. They, their model of teaching, you know, they taught seminars and use case studies to evaluate and to show these. And so they really go through and like Alexander's question, they talk about Alexander and, and how they developed and how he developed that question. So there, there are some great case studies in the book and, uh, it, it really breaks up the uh, monotony of, of some of the, the, the subject. Decision-making can be a very dry subject, but this one, it, the book is very easy to read. Great. And um, so I, I have to ask how uh, you've done such a great job of distilling um, some of these steps. So it's clear, you know, that you take this, this book, um, you know, that you've really thought it through. So have you used this in your own decision making? Uh, yes, I have. The, we have a particular current problem we're working on and our, all the documents go back a couple of years. And so I, I'm, the way the military is, we have a high turnover rate 
in uh, in our organizations. I'm I'm now one of the senior people in my my branch, and so I've actually developed a information paper on this on the subject, and I've got the relevant documents. Uh, I've got the basically the dates and times, my timeline, the facts, and how everything occurred so I can pass it on to my replacement. And I'm having to, to bring that up and I'm sending it out across various organizations in the Department of Defense so we can all kind of get on the same page and, and talk about it. So this is a, a pretty interesting way of looking at things and it, it really fits into, I think, how I think and, and how I operate. Great, thank you so much. Um, okay, so everybody uh, hang on for a couple of minutes. I'm just going to do uh, some housekeeping before we hit the Q&A section, um, but I'm looking forward to seeing what kinds of questions you have for our panelists. Go ahead and keep putting those into the Q&A box and I'll just do a little bit of housekeeping. I want to mention that next week, May 29th, we will have an author conversation between Clement's director, um, Paul Erickson, and author of the hymnal, Chris Phillips. And this is really an interesting book um, discussing uh, hymnals as a vessel for poetry. So join, uh, join us next week for that episode. And um, just a reminder that once you're registered for the bookworm, you'll receive the reminder next week so you don't have to register again. And if you're unable to attend the live event, as we mentioned, you'll still receive the email with the link to recordings and resources. And that email will be sent out later today. You can also view the previous episodes on our website. So we'll provide a link for that as well. I'm very excited to announce, um, we did a poll quite a while ago asking if anyone was interested in uh, bookworm apparel and many people said yes. So um, our uh, very own Chris Ridgeway developed this lovely uh, insignia design for us for um, some shirts. And we've been working with Underground Printing who will then print the shirts and send them out to you all. So we have an online order form. It will be open until June 7th at midnight. And then the orders will ship out around June 22nd. So take a look at this apparel. We'll also provide a link in the email and the proceeds from this will benefit the Clements Library. Uh, mentioning benefiting the Clements Library, I know many of you already support us financially and I thank you for that. But if you don't and are enjoying these programs and would like to, we'll put a link in the chat for that as well. Um, we hope that you're enjoying hearing how we continue to use and explore history. And we do have plans to continue the bookworm weekly through the end of summer, and then we'll evaluate going forward. And on the website, we're starting to post those uh, topics that we have planned for the weeks coming up. All right, so let me stop my share and check out the Q&A section. Looks like we've got some good questions. Um, all right, the first one is for, for Doug. Uh, which of the four leaders' leadership capabilities improved most during their careers? Oh boy, that's a good question. I'd be inclined to say Lincoln. He was remarkably uh, insightful and analytic about his own uh, view of the events around him. And one of the uh, maxims, in fact, that uh, Goodwin identifies is find a private place to retreat to to reflect on what's going on. So he would be my nomination. 
All right, thank you. Um, all right, let's see. So, Sarah, could you talk a little bit more about the aptitudes for women to become code breakers and um, mention where they came from? Sure. Um, so, originally, um, as I was talking about before, they were recruited out of colleges. Um, a lot of times, uh, the Navy and the Army were asking professors to identify women that they thought were some of the brightest um, in their classes, and then they would be um, sent a letter or have a private meeting um, with a dean or a professor um, talking about how, you know, uh, your country needs you for secret work. Are you interested? Um, and then they would participate in um, some in-person classes and mostly the correspondence course. And while they were all learning um, the basics of script analysis, um, they were also being graded and determined um, if they were of sufficient quality to proceed further. Um, there were also background checks. Um, a lot of times, like if you were of possible foreign parentage or birth, um, that could kind of be a disqualifying factor. Um, and then going forward, you know, once they start having to recruit en masse, um, if you were enlisting um, or going to officer school as a member of the WAVES or the WACs, um, they would have different aptitude tests. Um, and if you scored high in, you know, math, um, or if you had a foreign languages background, um, scored high on the intelligence test, um, that would sort of indicate to kind of pull you out for that type of thing. Um, and then also, I think, uh, you know, well, there were some people who went together with their friends, but I think it was more that they were going to the recruiting office at the same time. I don't know if there was a ton of people personally reaching out to anyone because you can't. Um, they, did, they did send uh, military officers out sometimes um, to hotels and communities and kind of recruit that way and say, if you're interested, you know, take these tests. They tried to pick the handsome ones. <laughs> um, and, and there were some brochures that were sent out too, but again, couldn't really say what they were recruiting for. So some women sort of had a romanticized notion of what life would be when they showed up and it wasn't quite what they expected, uh, but a lot of women were really excited, particularly women who were um, teaching because they were vastly underpaid and overwhelmed with their jobs and really might not even have any interest in doing that. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, looks like this one's for you, Strauss. In the Army, what if a private has a good suggestion for a general? So that's a really good, good question. Uh, the, the military is extremely hierarchical organization. They, uh, there's a stratification, and I would say that uh, the different services are also very, very different in how they apply that. The Navy much more so than most stereotypically. Um, the, the big thing is that the, the levels from private to general are so, so big. Uh, the best thing they can do is talk to their, to their sergeants, talk to the junior officers, and it could work its way up. Uh, the Air Force, is, I think, is one of the best examples of how that happens. They have a, a digital suggestion box and several airmen have used leading technology to uh, 3D print parts that were seen as unreliable or too expensive. And so they just started printing their own inside their hangar and their, their uh, maintenance available rate just dramatically increased. And that caught the attention of the chief of staff of the Air Force. So it's more of... I think executing your idea with a, a junior leader approval that will catch the attention. Um, inside of headquarters, they're especially like the size of Indo-Pacific Command, there aren't that many privates. And so the, the mixing doesn't happen as much, but at that level, anyone who has a good idea that, ha that can articulate it can, can present it and it'll work its way through. Unfortunately, with the, the stratified type of organization and the uh, top down and the <clears throat> rigid structure, you know, sometimes some ideas change and everyone has to put their finger on it because they, they need to claim a little credit sometimes. But most of the time, uh, it's, it's truly trying to improve the idea or make it work. But uh, that, that's a really tough call. If, uh, if my uh, grandfather had had a great idea right at the beginning of his career and tried to talk to a two-star, I don't think that would have gone as well. 
as uh, as we hoped it would. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Um, I have I have one for you, Doug. That uh, I I'm wondering about. I know there's been some talk that Doris Kearns Goodwin plagiarized some of her work. Do you do you have any thoughts about that? Well, yes, as someone who followed her work avidly, um, I was very interested when I saw these reports. In preparing for this morning, I went back and discovered uh, a couple of articles, uh, one 2002 in Forbes magazine. Um, she at one point tried to pass this off as just some casual uh, sloppiness in research. Well, it turned out that her publisher, the publisher of the book, the Fitzgeralds and the Kennedys, had reached a settlement with an author who had, was complaining about being plagiarized and the agreement was kept confidential for a long time. So that kind of undermines the, the um, attempt to pass it off as just a minor uh, trivial offense. Uh, the good news, I guess, is that she did ultimately recall all of the unsold versions of that edition, rewrote and republished a version uh, with new sourcing and clean attributions. And the other point is that uh, in the five or six titles that have been published since then, there's never been any uh, recurrence of that accusation. So it was obviously a very painful point in her history. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Thanks for providing that information. Um, Let's see, Tom Wagner asks, are decision makers good at judging the risk associated with different decisions, investment versus reward? I can jump on that one. Okay. <laughs> uh, so Thomas, that's a really good question. And I think the answer is no. Uh, in my experience, a lot of people uh, depending on their personalities will either over or under value the risk. And I think it goes back to the first step is, is really understanding what you want to happen, what we would call it the end state in the military, but wh what do you want the world to look like after you're done? Then the, look at the, the threats or the impacts to that, what will prevent you or help you too much achieve your end goal, then what likelihood is that to happen? And then those two together that the likelihood and the severity will, will create that risk for you. And what's interesting is we talk a lot about risk in a negative view, but risk can also be positive where you overachieve. Well, what do you do if you succeed beyond your wildest dreams? How do you follow that up? How do you keep going? A good example is World War II in the European theater when Patton and Montgomery uh, did so well when they broke out of the Bocage area of France and they outran their supply lines. Patton had tanks that could not drive down the road because he ran out of gas. He ran out of bullets. They ran out of food. And so they succeeded so well that they had to stop. And that gave the Germans arguably time to regroup and, and, continue to defend themselves. If we had done it maybe a little slower, we might have been able to keep them on the run longer. You know, a good, a good counterfactual argument could be made. But the, uh, you also have to look at the positive risk, what happens when you overachieve. So, uh, but I, I think the, 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 nut, the, the nugget of your question is that a lot of people don't understand what risk actually is and how to frame it. And, uh, Usually the simplest way is the best. Um, but if we can understand the risk, what, what are we going to get the payoff for the, the likelihood of not getting anything would, would be great. But I don't think a lot of leaders truly understand it like they should. Positive risk is such an interesting idea. I, I have to say that the first example that came to mind in my life 
is this program because we sort of intended to do it for four or five or six weeks and then it turned out to um you know so it was a risk to start the program but i hadn't really considered that people might want it to continue past that so it's it's an exciting thing but yeah i had a couple of weeks there where i was like huh how am i how am i going to organize all of this <laughs> how, how do i keep going now exactly <laughs> so um all right, so Sarah, um, uh, Wally and Barbara are wondering, does the book Code Breakers deal with a certain number of women or does the book, and does the book give background about those women? Yes, um, so there are a couple of women that feature most prominently. Um, one woman in particular, Dorothy Dot Braden, um, was uh, from Lynchburg, Virginia attended, uh, managed to attend college um, in her hometown and then went on to become a teacher and hated it and came home and was figuring out what she was going to do with her life and they happened to be recruiting at the hotel in town and she went on um, to work um, at Arlington Hall for the Army. Um, and I believe Liza Mundy was able to have extensive interviews with her. There's some pictures um, from both during and after the war um, talking about Dot and her friendship with another woman, Ms. Weston, that she worked with and uh, their lives after the fact. Um, so she really delves kind of using her, um, she keeps going back to her throughout the book, talking about her experience at Arlington Hall, but also uh, her personal experience. So she was writing several men during the war. Um, one uh, boyfriend from college really wanted to marry her and sent her a ring. And she kept kind of trying to put him off. She didn't want to break his morale, but she really liked her work and didn't want to get married. Um, well involved with that and then there was another man um that she had i think it was like a two-year correspondence with and they ended up deciding to marry and that was her husband. um and there there are a couple other women like that i think she's definitely the most prominent and then there's a couple other women and then there's a lot of names that she'll come back to and who kind of check in with and then um you know some names that only come up once or twice too but you sort of get an idea of just how many people were involved in all of their stories are really interesting. And I think when she talks about um, their lives outside of work, but also how their work also is so integrated with their lives, you know, it was very stressful in the fact that they knew what they were working on and how important it was as related to their loved ones who were fighting in the war. And um, some of the most poignant moments are when they're talking about how the women knew about what was happening to maybe the ships that um, their brother or fiance was on and um, you know they didn't but they might not know if they had been killed in action yet or they could tell their family that their loved one was okay but they couldn't tell them how or you know have any basis for that information um, and that that just like that work environment um, some of them after the war were like I, I'm done it, it's just been I'm glad that I participated but it was a lot of stress and took a toll for sure Oh, wow. That's, yeah, that gave me goosebumps because that, that would be really ooh, hard. So um, we have another question for you. And I, I love that it's related to Hawaii where Strauss is. <laughs> Were women stationed in Hawaii as World War II code breakers? So Elizabeth says that her dad was a naval code breaker in Hawaii in World War II. Oh, how cool. Um, there were women stationed in Hawaii, I believe, through the WAVES program. I don't think any of them were code breakers, and if there were, it was a very small number. Um, she talks about how women in the WAVES program, a number of them did want to go abroad, and every time uh, the form came up, are you interested or you know, transfer? They said, yes, send me abroad. And they were like, not now, thank you for your um, interest. Um, most of the code breaking operations, they were centralized at one point, um, though there were intercept stations on the West Coast and elsewhere in the country. Um, I think that's, you know, to keep things close together, uh, eliminates the uh, time in between processes. Um, she talks about how getting the intercepts could take a very long time, which initially is one reason why a lot of members of the government and the military didn't really see much use in it, um, because Yes, they could be coming through a teletype machine or cable, but they could also be coming by airmail. And so you'd have to put it on a boat and the boat would come to the US and then it'd have to make its way across the US to DC. Um, 
and then also the fact that they were women um, that had a lot of implications if you're putting them um, in an active theater of war. Um, so, so not a, a ton, but she did say there were a few women that served in Hawaii. She doesn't really go into what capacity, um, but that would be interesting. There were, I don't, she doesn't really talk about a lot overseas either, um, but yes, there were definitely uh, male um, codebreakers and members of this whole organization working um, even in like the Pacific theaters on the islands, um, recovering code books and sending um, messages from there. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I know uh, we're getting, it's already after 11. Uh, I, maybe we can still answer one or two more questions, but also I want to give the panelists a chance to ask each other questions if they would like to, because during, during our initial, um, you know, get together, we had such great discussions and I know that, that you all might have questions for each other. So um, Chomping at the bit. Are you? <laughs> Go ahead then. Great, thanks. Sarah, I wanted to ask about that wonderful photo you used of the workroom where the women were uh, surrounded by paper and hard at work. Uh, students of organizations would observe that the nature of the work that they were doing is best fitted to a more collegial approach to managing that work. I'm curious whether your author uh, ever touched on any of that aspect of what was going on. Uh, yeah, uh, definitely. Um, so the photos uh, from a department at Arlington Hall, um, which was uh, Army headquarters of code breaking operations. Um, and she really kind of gives a a really interesting idea of how Arlington Hall um, looked like as a workplace. Um, I definitely saw some similarities to Bletchley Park. I think it's because they have this really interesting mix of military personnel, civilians, um, whether they're academics, college graduates, or you know, even, even if you hadn't gone to college, um, if you had maybe just only graduated from high school, but you tested well on these tests and you were a young woman who showed promise, uh, they'd scoop you up. And um, they, um, it, it was just a very interesting um, style. You had uh, people of various ranks and backgrounds heading units. Um, and a lot of times people, um, you know, at the higher up positions, if they recognized um, that you were really good at this one particular task or something, um, you might start at a lower level, um, but they would, if you showed quickly what you were capable of, they would start putting you in more and more um, senior roles. Um, and they also talk about how, you know, the women um, even doing not necessarily in a leadership role would uh, help kind of come up with ideas to fine tune the system, improve it. Um, so they were a lot of times you were getting information or messages and they would um, put all this information on punch cards and sort them and then they were able to kind of keep track of everything. And um, One woman was like, well, why don't we sort everything um, from, I, I believe it was like date and place where it came from so we can see if we're getting duplicates of messages or how to compare to see if we have duplicates of messages and if we can break the code that way. Um, and people thought that was a great idea so they started doing that. Um, so it was sort of always in flux and you know, they wanted to make sure they were as successful as possible. You couldn't really, um, you, you had to work together in this collective environment. Um, it wasn't, it would have been completely frowned upon to sort of like hoard everything to yourself. And um, I mean, some people sometimes did, there was territoriality for sure. Um, but especially in the army co-breaking operations, it was a little more um, freewheeling. <laughs> um, the Navy operations, yes, but um, as Strauss mentioned, it was definitely uh, more hierarchical. Um, you did see more um, socializing between enlisted and officers amongst the women um, because they went through together and also like a lot of college graduate women uh, really wanted to join WAVES, um, but there was a cap on the number that could become officers and some of them didn't want to wait, so they just enlisted as um, regular enlistees. So you sort of had a variety of backgrounds anyway. Uh, 
Hey, Angela. Thank you. Yes. Oh, oh sorry, Doug. Um, so I, there's a a really good. I think Francis Olson is asking a really good question. Oh, perfect. Please. That, and um, I was going to ask Doug a question, but I think I think one of the mem one of the attendees has a better one than I was going to ask Doug. <laughs> um, so it, so she asked, uh, "What would a leader do with what would change your mind?" Questions, and I got that's important. Uh, so uh, I think the 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 thing is that it's based on your assumptions, your stereotypes, what your own biases, and. And so if you assume a, an answer or a piece of information you don't know for sure, that's really what would change your mind. If something's not, uh, did not occur or did not uh, result in, the, in what you thought it was supposed to be, that's really uh, what, what the leader should be asking themselves is, is that if that piece of information changes, if, you know, if we're supposed to go down the road at, you know, and take a left, but you know, wh whoever you're involved with takes a right, that would be the big decision. Oh, I got to change something. And it's just that self-awareness, I think, that we all want, want our leaders to have is that, that awareness of what would change your mind. I think uh, the Vietnam War is a good example where we, we did not let anything change our minds. LBJ, McNamara, they, they had a vision of what they wanted and nothing would change their minds or, or take them off that track that they were on. So uh, that's a, I think that's what would happen. That's the, the answer is it's that when is information telling me my decision was wrong or my underlying assumptions were wrong and I need to do something different. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, Francis. Great. Thank you. I'd like to jump on with a slight addition to that, if I may. One of the best bosses I ever had had a habit of beginning discussions of major decisions with a question, what information do we need to have in order to make this decision? And when framed that way, it was not uncommon to people to start thinking, oh, you know, we really need to know X, Y, Z rather than just jumping in to a decision. And that was a great corrective to make the decisions more thoughtful and more carefully reached. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much to all of you for bringing these wonderful books to our attention and for sharing your insights and your um, personal ideas as well. Uh, we really appreciate that. And thank you to everybody who tuned in today. We appreciate your participation in the chat and in the Q&A, and we hope to see you again next week. All right, thanks everybody. Have a great day. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.